All right. So in this problem, we're given uh, a diagram of a wave as it moves along the positive x-axis. And this is illustrated to us because we can see that there's a little dotted line version of the wave just to the right of the solid black end version of the wave, showing that this is its new position after a little bit of time. And uh, we can see here that this shows a small distance d uh, between one between the crest of the wave at a point and uh, that same crest of the wave after a little period of time later. And this uh, small distance d is given to us as um, 6.0 centimeters. And we're told that this distance uh, occurs after a period of 4.0 milliseconds. Uh, the problem also tells us that the scale of this graph is given to the point where each one of these little tick marks here along the x-axis is uh, 10 centimeters. So that's 10 centimeters uh, per uh, tick mark, you could say. Um, not only that, but also we're given the total height of the wave, this capital H here on the left. And we're told that that is equal to uh, 6.00 millimeters. And the last bit of information we're given about the wave is kind of obvious, but this wave is going to uh, conform to the usual uh, conventions of uh, the wave formula, where y is written with respect to the, the x distance, the distance along the x-axis, and time where the wave is going to be equal to uh, the maximum position of the wave, or its amplitude, multiplied by the sine function of uh, the angular wave number times the x position, plus or minus uh, the angular frequency multiplied by the time that has elapsed. And all that is, and all that is the, the phase, in the, the phase constant and the sine number. And now we are told to find all of the all the constants in this formula here. So namely, we are asked to find uh, the y sub m, uh, the k, the angular wave number, the angular frequency, and the sine that will go in between them. So let's start with part a. So part a asks us to find uh, this little bit right here. We're asked to find y sub m. Now, what y sub m represents is the amplitude of the function. And if you don't uh, remember that, if you don't realize that, you can kind of think of it like this. Uh, the, seeing as how most of this function is written as a sine function, if you know your rules of sines, then you know that on its own, a sine function of anything, no matter what, is in between these parentheses for the sine function, it will never have a magnitude greater than 1. So this is on its own. So the sine function on its own will never be greater than 1, and it will never be less than negative 1. The only way for the magnitude to increase uh, is for there to be another number m multiplying that sine function, or multiplying that cosine function, because it applies to cosine as well. So that's why we have, so when we have this number on the outside here, multiplying the sine function, uh, we can think of that as the amplitude, because that is going to be affecting the, uh, the vertical position of the wave function at any given time. Uh, in other words, it will be affecting the maximum vertical values of the wave. That's what this m subscript means. It means the maximum value of uh, the y direction. So the amplitude uh, is going to be the distance between uh, the vertical middle point of the wave, which in this case is going to be the x-axis, it's going to be the distance from that middle vertical position to the, the maximum distance from that middle position. So in other words, it's going to be the distance from the x-axis to the, the highest point of one of these crests, or it'll be the distance from the, from the x-axis to the lowest point of one of these troughs here. So the way we can find that, the way we can uh, find that is by taking our total height, which we have a, a variable for, and dividing it by 2. 
because in a wave that is uniform like this, it is just going to be the same as half of the total distance from the from the, one of these crests to one of the troughs. And so because we're given the height, the height is 6.00 millimeters, we can simply just take that and divide it in half. Uh, and that is going to give us uh, an amplitude of 3 uh, millimeters here. So that is our answer for part A. So now we have that. Now let's try and find the, uh, the angular wave number, or this little k here in front of the x in the phase. Now, uh, k, as usual, is going to be equal to 2 pi divided by the wavelength, uh, represented by the lambda symbol here. Uh, and so we are not given the wavelength in the problem, but we can figure it out given the information we're given. So if you'll recall, the wavelength of a wave is it is basically the total distance of it of a single oscillation you can think of it as so if if for example we have uh, a wave that starts if we t if we take a section of a wave that starts at the crest for instance then the wavelength will be the total distance before it gets to that crest again like over here or we don't have to just apply it to crests and troughs. We can also apply it to any given point uh, on the wave that represents a total oscillation of its movement. For example, if we start here at the very at the origin where uh, x equals or x equals zero, then it's going to be an oscillation before we get back to this point. So a misconception some people might have is that it'll be before it gets to that point again. So let's say. Oh, okay. So we start right here at the origin, and looky over here, it goes right back to the point where x equals zero. But no, you have to keep in mind that it has to go through a full oscillation of its movements. So it has to go all the way up, and then it has to go all the way down before it comes back to that point. So a single wavelength would be like from the origin to this point, or or it'll be uh, uh, from uh, one of these troughs to the next trough. Uh, so basically, you just want to find the distance between two points on the wave that correspond to one another. So if you want this to be as easy as possible on you, it might be the easiest to uh, think of it in terms of the crests and troughs. But if that's not available to you, then, just, then you do want to think of it in terms of an oscillation. So for example, uh, let's start right at the beginning, right at the origin here. We want the distance from here to a total oscillation, which, as we can see, is after the wave goes all the way up and after it goes all the way down. It then comes back to that point right here. So what is the distance between uh, the origin and this point right here? Uh, now, the question gives us uh, the scale of the graph. It is 10 centimeters per tick. So uh, it looks like there are four ticks between there. So that's 10, 20, 30, 40. So that is... A wavelength of 40 centimeters. So we'll want to put 40 centimeters in for the wavelength here. So that is 2 pi divided by the wavelength. Uh, however, it's worth noting you'll probably want to convert centimeters into meters because uh, with a formula like this, you'll, as usual, you will want to get your units into base SI units. So 40 centimeters is going to be equal to 0 0.40 meters. And plugging this into your calculator, we get an angular wave number of 16 radians per meter, or 16 reciprocal meters. And that is our angular wave number. And now we are asked to find the angular frequency, this little omega symbol here that goes with uh, the t, with the time value. And this part is probably probably the trickiest part of this question because it requires us to do a number of calculations, but none of it is too unmanageable. Now, we want to have some sort of relation between the angular frequency and some of the values we're given here, which might not be immediately obvious because without doing some algebra, without doing some derivation, uh, you probably don't have in your head 
uh, a single formula that immediately solves for the angular frequency. But we can relate it, we can create one by relating the angular frequency to a formula we already have. And what do I mean by that? Well, uh, if you go through your formulas, if you go through the equations you have for the variables of a, of a wave, uh, you might notice you might notice one jumping out to you that does involve the angular frequency, and it is the formula for the speed of a wave, which is give, which uh, one of the formulas for the speed of a wave is given to us as the angular frequency divided by the angular wave number. So now we have a formula that involves the uh, the angular frequency and the angular wave number, which we just solved for already. So doing a bit of algebra. Let it, uh, we'll find that a formula for the angular frequency on its own is going to be equal to the angular wave number times the speed of the wave. Now we have the angular wave number, but we don't have the speed of the wave. So how are we going to find that? If we had the speed of the wave, then we'll be able to plug those values into our formula and get the angular frequency. But fortunately, with the information we're given about the, uh, the wave, we can find the... Um, uh, the speed of the wave pretty easily with the information we're given. Uh, so we'll want to. So in order to find the speed of a wave, without uh, being told that directly, we'll want to think of the speed of the wave in terms of the speed of individual points. Now keep in mind, with the typical transverse waves, the points on the string are not are generally not actually moving in any direction. It, uh, the points on a string are usually, in fact, just going up and down. But if we're trying to find the speed of the wave itself, we can, for a moment, imagine that a single point on the string is traveling from left to right, assuming we are paying attention to uh, the correct point on the wave uh, with respect to wavelengths and all that. So if we wanted to find uh, the, the speed of the wave, it's going to be the same general process as finding the speed for any moving particle. And the speed for any moving particle is going to be equal to the distance it moves with respect to time. So the distance it moves, it moves over a period with, uh, divided by that period, or distance over time. Now because we are given this little distance that the, the crest moves over a period of 4 milliseconds, we can relate that to get a, uh, a velocity, or we'll be able to use that to get a speed of the wave. And it's going to be 6 centimeters over a period of 4 milliseconds. So converting that into our base units, that is going to be, let's see, 6 centimeters is going to be equal to uh, 0 0.06 meters divided by uh, 4 milliseconds, or 0 0.0 zero four zero seconds and uh, dividing these quantities by each other we get a speed of 15 meters per second now that we have the speed of the wave now we can use that along with uh, the angular wave number we found in part b to get our angular frequency so to plug these into our formula that is going to be an angular wave number times the wave speed so that is 16 reciprocal meters uh, multiplied by uh, 15 meters per second. Now let's multiply these values by each other and plugging these into your calculator you get an angular frequency of um, uh, 2.4 times 10 to the second power of radians per seconds. So that is our angular frequency. Now the final part of the question is uh, possibly the most simple, because it doesn't actually require us to do a calculation. We are simply asked to find uh, the sine in the... Uh, we're simply to find... Uh, we're asked to determine whether this sine right here in the middle of the phase is going to be plus or minus. So in other words, is the angular frequency times time going to be positive or negative? And we can simply figure this out using... Uh, the basic rules were given for the way this wave function works. And how that goes is that if the wave is propagating to the right along the positive x-axis, then it is going to be negative. If the wave is propagating to the left along the negative x-axis, it is going to be positive. Now, as we can see, 
from this little uh, distance symbol we're given here as the uh, we're shown that the wave is propagating to the right. So that alone pretty simply tells us that the sign uh, of the uh, the angular frequency and the time is going to be negative. And that is all the information we can get to fill in the blanks for this wave formula right here.